If you have your Bible with you this morning, we're going to be looking at Psalms 116. We're going to jump around a couple other places, but this will be our primary text, and the other text will be found here um, on the PowerPoint this morning. We're going to be beginning a new series today entitled The School of Prayer, and I really, I really feel, I really believe, I feel really burdened that at this season in my life, and really even this, this season in the life of this church, this is really a message that I think that we really need. Um, that prayer needs to be something that undergirds who we are and everything that we're about. Um, you know, we, we, are in the, we are in the midst, and I don't know that we ever get out of it, but we, we are in a spiritual, spiritual battle, right? I mean, I think we'd be in agreement with that, that, that we battle an enemy who wants to steal, to kill, and destroy, that he will do everything he can to try to, to thwart the Word of God and the work of God, and so I really feel burdened that uh, we need to look, we need to pause for a moment. At this, at this point, it's a three-part series. It may go longer than that. I don't know. We're going to start with three weeks is where we're at now. And I know for a lot of you, especially this morning, it's going to be very basic in this series. But I really feel like, or I really believe, I guess I'd rather say believe than feel like emotions are here and there, right? But I really believe that um, it's something that's important for us as we go back and we look at some of the basics about prayer and about our relationship with God. I think that most of us would agree that, that prayer is often an elusive concept or it's an elusive subject. We, there are times that we struggle with knowing what to say or what to pray, right? I mean, there are some things that we experience in life that the Bible even says we don't even know how to pray and the Spirit intercedes for us. But really, if we're real honest, we, we struggle with trying to figure out sometimes the language of what it means to pray. Some of us, were in a public setting, we're scared to death that someone might call on us to pray in public. Uh, that'd be the worst case scenario. Well, I, I give the Sunday night group a hard time because it, it's amazing how adults are just like teenagers. Um, I remember being in youth ministry and you'd say, okay, let's pray. And they immediately would bow their head and close their eyes, hoping that if they did it quick enough that you wouldn't call on them to pray. And I've noticed uh, on Sunday nights, our adults do the same thing. They notice that you're sort of winding up, and they all go into a, a moment of prayer. Uh, of course, sometimes I tend to call on people that do that, but um, there's always fear and trepidation about calling on somebody to pray in public because some people just lock up, and so some it's a great fear. There, there are some of us that may even wonder if prayer really makes any difference in our lives at all. Some of us may think about some of the old hymns that we've heard through the years, Sweet Hour of Prayer, and to think about praying 30 minutes is mind-blowing, much less praying for an hour. I think most of us would say that if we would have been there in the Garden of Gethsemane with the Lord, when he told his disciples to step and pray, we would have been like those disciples. We probably would have been there asleep, right? Um, I probably would have been one of the first ones out cold. Um, and so I want us to think about this school of prayer, to go back to the basics about prayer. And I want us to begin today by asking the question, why pray? Why should we pray? And I know it's a basic, a basic question, and really, as I give you the answer, you're going to say, that is so basic, that's so simple. Couldn't you go a little bit deeper than that? But I think it speaks clearly from God's Word, as the psalmist gives us in Psalms 116. He goes through his struggles, his desire to be saved, desire for God to work in his life, and it's, it's through that lesson that he encounters with the Lord there in Psalms 116 that I want to point out three reasons why we should pray. And we're going to look at verses 1 through verse 9 of Psalms 116. <clears throat> Bear with me this morning. I'll try not to cough into this microphone, okay? Uh, my sinuses, I thought they were getting better and then woke up this morning and they're crazy again, so bear with me a little bit. Beginning in Psalms 116, uh, verse 1, and we'll look through verse 9. The psalmist, and we're not really sure who wrote this psalm. We're not given any indicators. But beginning in verse 1, it says, I love the Lord because he has heard my appeal for mercy. Because he has turned his ear to me, I will call out to him as long as I live. The ropes of death are wrapped around me, and the torments of Sheol, or the torments of the grave, the torments of death itself overcame me. I encountered trouble and sorrow. Then I cried on the name of the Lord, Lord, save me. And he says in verse 5, the Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is compassionate. The Lord guards the inexperienced. He says, I was helpless, and he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, rescued me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Let's pray together. 
Lord, I just want to ask this morning as we look at your word, I pray, God, that you would you'd make it real and, God, that you would make it alive as you speak into our lives, that you give us a sense of assurance, a sense of direction on really why we should pray. And so, Father, I pray that your word would transform and change our lives. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You know, as we think about this question, why I pray, it'd be very easy to give the answer that my dad would often give me when I was growing up, and I would ask him a question about why I should do something. Anybody got a guess on why he would tell, why the answer he gave me on why I asked why? Because I said so, right? Michael, you hear that all the time from your daddy, because I say so? Um, and God could say that, right? I mean, matter of fact, we're t- I think it's in 1 Timothy chapter 1 that Paul told, told, told young Timothy, his disciple, his child in the faith, that he is to pray, and he goes through several different terms of pray. He just says, pray. He doesn't tell him why to pray, he just says, pray. But really, what I love about God is that God is real with us, and he gives us a lot more than just do it because I said to do it. He gives us some instruction and guidance. And I want, as we think about Psalms 116 here this morning, I want us to look at some of the reasons, or really three reasons why the psalmist tells us we should pray. The first reason he tells us we should pray is because God hears. We should pray because God hears. Look with me again at verse 1 and verse 2. The psalmist says, I love the Lord because he has heard my appeal for mercy. Because he has turned his ear to me, I will call out to him as long as I live. Now, we could spend a lot of time in the first part of verse 1 where he says that the reason why I love the Lord is because he has appealed. I mean, he has heard my appeal for mercy. Couldn't we who are Christians say that same thing, that we love the Lord because he has shown us mercy when we didn't deserve mercy, right? The Bible says, we talked about last week, that the wages of sin is death. We deserve death and separation from God, and yet God his love has shown us mercy, and because of that, we should love him. But what he says here is not only because of what he's done, but he says, because he has heard my appeal. Because he has heard my appeal, that he has turned his ear to me. The word heard here, uh, it means to listen or to play, cl- to play close attention to. If you thought about that, that the God of creation listens closely to the things that you say, that when you interact with him, when you share your heart with him, that God hears your cries. But the psalmist in verse 2 doesn't just say that God has heard, but he draws us a word picture that says that God has turned his ear to me. When we think about this picture, I'm reminded of this, you know, back in the 70s and 80s when I was sort of growing up. You know, all your discipleship stuff had these little goofy little drawings. I'll never forget this one drawing. And I went back trying to find it, looking through some of my old discipleship books. But there was this picture, it was sort of a cartoonish looking picture, and it showed God in heaven, and really all it was, you saw this big ear sticking out of the clouds. And that's sort of what I get the picture here as the psalmist lays out, that, that God turns his head, he turns his ear, so that he might hear us clearly, is what the picture that David lays, or not David, but the psalmist lays out. Does God need to turn his ear to hear what we say? No. I mean, as I get older, I find myself turning my ear. Or even this morning, I had the vent going, and Becky's talking to me in the other room. I'm like, and I got the toothbrush going. I'm like, I can't hear what you're saying. Let me see your mouth moving, you know. Let me hear. And that's the picture here is that the psalmist says that God turns his ears to his children so that he can hear the words that come out of our mouth, so that God can hear the desires of our heart. We think about this idea, this picture of God, that we look at Isaiah chapter 40, that, that, that this, um, Isaiah lays this picture out about God. He says that, that God is the great God who measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. You think about the God who created the heavens and the earth, and that the, me- the exact measurement of the waters upon this earth, that God measured them out, in his hand, that he marked off the heavens with the span of his hands, that he considers the nations as nothing before him, that they are, that they are empty nothingness. The, Isaiah says that the God is the creator of the whole earth who never becomes faint or weary. Think about that. The God who created everything, the God who is so great that with all of our nuclear weapons and all the junk that we have and our mighty armies, that God considers the nations of this earth as empty nothingness. That's pretty strong, isn't it? And that he created the earth that he never becomes faint or weary, and yet this great and awesome God leans out of heaven and turns his head so that he can hear us when we pray. And what an awesome concept that 
this great and awesome and mighty God cares about the things that we say, that he wants to hear us, that he hears our prayer. But let me ask you a question here this morning. The Lord is listening for your voice. Is he hearing anything? The Lord is listening for your voice, but is he hearing anything? Are we praying? James says we have not because we ask not. Is God's ear hangs out of heaven to hear your voice? Does God hear you? Are you praying? It's important. We prove that we believe that prayer is real by our prayers. Some words of caution about prayer. God is not listening for mindless chatter. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, it says, When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. And how often do we start praying over a meal and we get through and we can't even remember what we prayed. Or we say the same repetition of things over and over and over again. We wake up in the morning and we say our prayers and use it as a list of all the things that we want and how we want God to work in our lives and how much of that time are we really just talking to God because that's really what prayer is, right? It's not mindless chatter. It's not, it's not necessarily speaking in some unknown language. It's, it's bearing our heart and being open and honest before God and bringing him to the desires of our heart to, to really lay out with him the things that, that we would normally carry on a conversation with a great and awesome God. Listen, prayer is simply a conversation with God. But also God is not listening to the heart that's unengaged. In Isaiah 29, verse 13, it says, The Lord said, These people approach me with their speeches to honor me with lip service, yet their hearts are far from me, and human rules direct their worship of me. And so what God is dealing with the people of Israel here, and he's saying, you know, you're, you're more concerned about your routine, you're more concerned about your, your, um, your, your performance, you're more worried about what other people think than you are really just communicating with me. Some of the people that I really love to hear is a lady that's a friend of mine, and I'm not going to say her name, some of you may know her. She didn't go to church here. When she sits down and begins to pray, you almost feel like you need to pull a chair up and sit down because you're in the presence of God. You know what's so spectacular about her prayers? They're just plain and simple. She's not trying to pretend. She's not trying to put on a show. She's talking with God like she would talk to her best friend because God really is her best friend. I think about a friend of mine who um, I went to church with when I was in Louisiana that almost every week, he, he was saved later in life. He was in his 70s when he came to know Christ. And he would pray over the offering, and he, every Sunday, he'd start crying. He couldn't get through his prayer. And I thought, he, every Sunday, he'd come to me, Pastor, I'm so sorry, I, I didn't mean to cry. And I'm like, man, I love your prayer, because your heart. And when he began to consider the greatness of what God had done for him, he was so moved with emotion at the greatness and the love and the mercy of God that his heart was stirred. It's not about a routine. It's not about being religious. It's just being honest before God. Also, God is not listening when our hearts are not right with him. In Psalm 66, verse 18, he says, If I had been aware of malice in my heart, he says, the Lord would not have listened. I love how the psalmist ended Psalm 66 in verse 19 and verse 20. He says, however, God has listened. He has paid attention to the sound of my prayer. He says, blessed be God. He has not turned away my prayer or turned his faithful love from me. Because the psalmist clearly understood the answer to unconfessed sin is what? The answer to unconfessed sin is confess it, right? Y'all thought that was some kind of trick question, didn't you? Y'all like, yeah, he's setting us up with this one. It's too simple. I mean, when we have unconfessed, unconfessed sin in our life, when the Holy Spirit convicts us, our response is to confess it. 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess that he is faithful and he is righteous where he forgives and he cleanses us. So why pray? First of all, because God hears. The second reason why we are to pray is because God cares. Listen, why does God hear our prayers? The reason why God hears our prayers is because he cares about us. God cares about you. God cares intimately about everything in your life. And those things that, that are, bur are a burden on your heart, and when you talk to other Christians, you say, you know, I'm so sorry that, you know, this thing, I know it's not a big deal. 
Well, if it's on your heart, it's a big deal to you, right? Don't matter what anybody else thinks. If it's, a, if it's important to you, it's important to God because God cares for you. In verse 3 and verse 5, he said, verses 3 through verse 5, he says, The ropes of death are wrapped around me, and the torments of Sheol, the, Sheol, the, the torments of death, the grave, overcame me. I encountered trouble and sorrow. And then I called on the name of the Lord, Lord, save me. And he says, The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is compassionate. We think about the psalmist here. He says that he's going through a bad time. I, that's the words I, I typed out was going through a bad time, but it, it almost sounds like an understatement, doesn't it? It sounds like an understatement because it doesn't sound just like a bad time. It sounds like a horrible place in his life where he says it feels like the ropes of death have been wrapped around him and they're literally dragging him into the grave, that he he feels like the torments of, of death itself have overcome him, that he has encountered trouble and sorrow. In the midst of his trouble and sorrow, he cries out to the Lord that the Lord would save him. And he says because of the fact that the Lord is gracious and righteous and compassionate, that the Lord saves him. What does it mean to be gracious? How would you define that word gracious? Huh? Full of grace? grace? Or bestowing grace or bestowing blessing upon someone, right? He's saying that my life is a literal hell. In the midst of that, God is pouring out his love on me, that God is putting his blessings upon my life. In the midst of that, he is a a blessing-giving God. That he's a righteous God. He's a God who does the right thing. And then he says that he is a compassionate God. And compassion is more than just feeling some emotional movement because of a sadness of something you see going on in their life, right? A compassion is love in action. Right? I mean, it's not just having empathy with somebody. It's being moved with compassion means that you're moved to meet a need in someone's life. And God is a loving God who is compassionate because he cares about the intimate details of our life. And what I would say to you here this morning is that whatever it is you're facing, I want you to know that God cares for you. And God cares about the things that are happening in your life. God cares about your marriage. He cares about your loneliness. He cares that you don't have a job. He cares that there may be something that's stealing the joy in your life. God cares about the strongholds even that you've allowed to be built up in your life. God cares about you. In the New Testament, the Apostle Peter puts it this way. This is a verse, if you stay here very long, you'll hear often because of the verse that God has used in my life over and over again. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your cares on him because he cares about you. We think about this idea of prayer and that we are to pray because God cares for us, that, that he tells us, Peter says, that we are literally to, to cast our cares upon him. I sort of get the picture where Jesus said that, that, we, that we come to him with a yoke that is heavy and we are to give our heavy yoke to him because his yoke is light. That the struggles and the hardships of this life are overwhelming, aren't they? I mean, there are times when we get up in the morning and we're going through difficult times in our life and we don't know how we're going to put one step in front of the other, and yet we do that by giving our burdens to the Lord because He cares for us. Listen, we pray because God hears. We pray because God cares. And then finally, we pray because God answers. I don't know if any, he's been gone a while now, but Adrian Rogers was probably one of my favorite preachers. Um, they used to call him the Prince of Preachers. Uh, when I first started seminary in Memphis, Tennessee, I wasn't on staff in a church for about three months, and um, we considered, you know, visiting different churches, and I thought, man, how could I not go to Bellevue and hear Dr. Rogers every Sunday? Um, of course, now I look back, and I think it would have been smarter if I would have went to a little bit smaller church to get a better idea of really how ministry goes on, because Bellevue seats 10,000 in their sanctuary, and they were having three Sunday morning services, so um, get a little idea a little false idea of what ministry really is about, right? Um, but Dr. Rogers, I don't know why I went off into all that. Dr. Rogers once said that the greatest spiritual truth that he knows is that God answers prayers. The greatest spiritual truth is that God answers prayers. Psalms 116, verse 6 through verse 9. It says, the Lord, the Lord guards the inexperienced. Man, that is me. The simple The Lord guards the inexperienced or the simple. He says, I was helpless, and he saved me. He says, return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, rescued me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, and I walked before the the Lord in the land of the living. 
He says that he was simple or inexperienced, that he was helpless, and the Lord saved him. And because of the Lord's salvation, that he was able to allow his soul to experience rest because the Lord had rescued him from death, had delivered his eyes from his tears and his feet from stumbling. And because of the Lord's work in his life, he was able to experience the land of the living. In Psalms 118, verse 5, the psalmist says, I call the Lord in distress, and the Lord answered me, and he put me in a spacious place. Jeremiah 33, 3 is a verse that I learned as a, as a kid, as a teenager. It says, call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and uncomprehensible things you do not know. That's not the translation I learned. And I will show you uncomprehensible things you do not know. That, that we call out to him. He says, if, if we call to him, that he will answer us. Jesus said, if we seek him, what will happen? We'll find him. And he says, if we knock, the door will be open to us, right? And so God is a God who answers prayer. But maybe some of you are saying here this morning, but, but Pastor, I've been praying, and God had not seemed to answer any of my prayers yet. I, I don't see God working at all. My word to you this morning is don't, don't quit. Don't give up. Keep trusting the Lord. Because, Lord, we, 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 want, is we, want, we want a quick prayer, don't we? I mean, we want a quick answer to our prayers. But the Lord isn't always quick in his answer, but he is always sudden in his answer. You get the difference between being quick to answer and being sudden to answer? We think about on um, Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas are preaching the word, and they come upon this lady who's demon-possessed, and they cast a demon out of her. She had been a fortune teller. She had made all this fortune for these guys. Y'all remember the story? And um, when the demon was gone, she was no longer able to tell fortunes. Can you imagine if you were a lost man, you own this little woman, she's one of your servants, one of your slaves, and you've been making money off her fortune telling, and all of a sudden she can no longer tell fortunes? They're not happy. And so they begin to cause a big riot. They have Paul and Silas arrested. Uh, they're beaten with rods. They're thrown into prison. Do you believe that throughout the process that Paul and Silas were crying out to God to deliver them from that situation? This means yes, this means no. I mean, after the service, if, if um, I, I had all the men say, you know, oh, dog, all you guys, I want you to take your belt off. And after the service, um, we're going to whip somebody. One, if we said that, it's going to happen. Would some of you slip out one of these doors right away? And if not, you'd be praying, dear God, please, please help this guy to understand that he's going to lose his mind. And I have 911 on my cell phone. No, we would cry out to God, right? I mean, if we were in that situation with Paul and Silas, we've been arrested, we're being beaten with rods, we would cry out for God to deliver him, and yet they still went through the beating. They still went through being put in prison. And it's, they, you know, it happens early in the day, and it goes all night until midnight. Anybody remember what happens as Paul and Silas begin to sing hymns to the Lord? But God, begins, God shakes the prisons and opens the gates. God delivers them in the midst of that. In a sudden moment, God came. Now, they had endured a lot of different stuff. There's some things in our life that, that God is looking beyond what we see. I mean, I'll be honest, I'm one of those kids, I didn't like spankings. I still don't like, I still wouldn't like a spanking now. Um, and I wanted to be delivered from them. But I, I look back, and I was one of those hard-headed kids that if my dad had not, dis and my mother had not disciplined me, I'd probably be in prison preaching at a state penitentiary right now. I'd be in Angola, because I grew up in Louisiana. I'd be in South Louisiana, Angola, and I'd be one of those church planters on one of the cell blocks is where I would be. <laughs> there was a reason for the discipline that God would brought into my life. We, we think about the difficult things that we want God to deliver us from or the things that we want God to answer in our lives, and we want them to be repaired like this. And th that life doesn't happen that way. And God is moving and God is working and God is preparing us. The Bible says that all things work together for good to those who love God who are called according to his purposes. And so even the difficult times of our lives, if God just were immediately to come in and rescue us from that situation, we there's a lot of life lessons we would never learn. And there's also an aspect that we would never become Christ-like because it's only through suffering, it's only through the hardships and difficulties of life that we really begin to project what it means to live the Christ life. And what kind of a witness would that be to those who are lost around us? If everything we touch always turned to gold, they would just think, man, that's the luckiest person I've ever known. Right? 
If everything you touched always was glow, I mean, flowers and pretty music, everything was always good. But when all hell breaks loose and you keep loving Jesus and you keep walking through it, trusting that God's going to work you through that situation, that's when you bear a testimony to a lost and dying world. And God's, God's, greatest, God's greatest desire is not to deliver you from your hardship, but God's greatest desire is to see this world come into his kingdom, to rescue those who are perishing. That's why Jesus went to the cross. Jesus died on the cross to pay the sin debt of the entire world. But it's only efficient for those who by faith receive that free gift of salvation. And the world desperately needs to see in our lives that Jesus is real and that we believe it in good times and bad times. Lord, even if you throw me in the flame and fire and I get burned up, I'm going to serve you the rest of my life. Even if you don't answer my prayers the way I want you to answer them, God, I'm going to stay faithful to what you've called me to do in my life. Lord, I, I'm not asking you to deliver me, even though that's what I want. But ultimately, Lord, I want your will to be done in my life. Because listen, the main purpose of our prayer is not just to get things from God. God is not, you know, some one-armed bandit that we put our prayer in and we pull it and God gives us whatever we want. But the real purpose of prayer is that we might grow closer to God. Listen, are you praying for something? Listen, don't quit. Don't give up. When you're tempted to stop, remember that God hears, God cares, and God answers. I, I want to I do the... I don't know, invitation is really not the right word. How I want to end out this message here this morning is this. You know, normally we'd say, you know, bow your head, and if you've got something that's heavy on your heart, raise your hand. Nobody looking, no eye looking. I'm the only one looking. I'm going to pray over you. You know, a lot of times why we don't get God, we don't hear answer prayer is because of pride. The Bible is very clear that we are to pray for one another, Right? Uh, Y'all looking at me real strange. We, we are to pray for one another. Our, our job is not to judge one another. Our job is to love each other and to pray for one another. And so what I, I want to, how I want to end the sermon part of this service this morning is this. If you're here this morning, and maybe there's a stronghold that's built up in your life where you've allowed the enemy to come in, and there's... There's an area of struggle that you have. Listen, don't raise your hand yet till I'm through because I'm going to ask several things, okay? But there's something in your life that, you're really, that you know is sin and you're really struggling with it. That we need to pray for each other. Maybe you're here this morning and you're real honest. You'd say, Pastor, I'm having marriage problems or I'm having family problems or I'm having kid problems. I'm having stepkid problems. Some type of family issue. We're to pray for each other. Maybe you're here this morning and, and God has laid a burden on your heart that, that he's wanting to do something in and through you and yet you are scared to death. You're scared to death to take that step of faith because you don't know what's going to happen when you take that, faith, that step of faith. Then we want to pray for you. Maybe you're here this morning and, and there's somebody that's laid upon your heart. Maybe it's a co-worker, maybe it's a family member that you know if they were to die that they are not prepared for death. They are not ready to die. And so you want, to, you want us as a church family to, to lift them up. We may not be calling them out by name, but, but we are going to pray for them, that God would draw them, that God would stir their heart, that God would give you opportunities to speak truth in their life. Maybe you say, Pastor, i got something I want, you to, I want you all to pray for. What I want us to do is if you have a prayer request, I want to encourage you just to raise your hand. Okay? Some of us. All right? I do. We've got some things that are heavy on our hearts. All right, what I want to do is I want to pray, and then i got a couple announcements at the end, but we'll pr I'm going to end this service by praying, and I hope that you looked around and saw some of the hands that were raised. And at the end of the service, when, after I do the final announcements, if you need somebody to talk to, I want to encourage you to come and talk to me.